Hello guys and welcome to Barking Mad Tech, an extremely low effort and extremely low budget tech channel dedicated to bringing you only the best in bad tech content. My name is Nick and today we're going back to the roots of this channel and putting together a used gaming PC build. As I'm sure most of you are aware, right now the PC market, both new and used, is an absolute mess. In terms of the new market, components are either not available at all or available only at vastly inflated prices. And for the used market, well, pretty much the same because people are willing to overpay for processors, graphics cards, motherboards, even memory, which is still fairly easy to get a hold of on the new market for normal, fairly good prices. So with all that in mind, why am I even putting together a PC today? Well, the fact is that I've had quite a few components just laying around doing nothing here at my house. And I'm sick of it. I would rather they do something. I'd rather they be put to use by someone who can use it uh, to actually play video games on it or do video editing, whatever they would uh, might like to do on a on a PC, essentially. So I figure it's better to put together and actually pass it on. Uh, now I didn't have everything, so a few things I did end up having to buy, but most of the things I actually did have lying around. So with all that said, how about we go through the components? So, let's start off with the things I had lying around, which is, as I said, actually quite a few things. Firstly, I have this MSI X470 Gaming Plus motherboard. It's a pretty nice motherboard, if a generation or two old. Uh, it's already updated to support Ryzen 3000 uh, processors, uh, and as you can see, it's, it's missing its backplate <laughs> for the socket, so I can't mount any AMD stock coolers to it, which is a shame, because I have quite a few of those lying around as well. Secondly, I have this GTX 1070 Dual OC from ASUS. Now, the 1070 is still a pretty damn good 1080p gaming card, and with older games can even do 1440p, yeah, it's quite high settings. It's quite nice that I have this actually, as I think it will make for an excellent GPU for this build, and as these are regularly going for almost 300 euros on the used market, at least here in Sweden, I guess it's lucky that I am a tech hoarder. This is actually a pretty special GPU for me personally because this was mine uh, and I used this, I bought this around Christmas 2016 and I used it until around the middle of, of uh, around the, yeah, around the summer of 2019 actually when I built my, my new PC but uh, this served me very well and then it served my brother very well and I hooked him up with an upgrade to an RTX 2060 so now I have it back and we're gonna, we're gonna build it, build a PC with it here today. Uh, Storage-wise, I have this. This is a Kingston 512GB SSD. Now, it is in the M.2 form factor, but it is using a SATA interface, so just about 500 megabytes read and, uh, per second uh, read and write speeds. So, nothing special, but nothing to scoff at either. And to back that up, I also have this 4 terabyte 7200RPM hard drive from Seagate, which should be uh, more than enough for this build, and essentially any build, really. And... Uh, yeah, that's going to be a storage configuration. Uh, finally, uh, I have this Corsair VS550 power supply. Now, it's not modular. It's not the most amazing quality power supply, but it will be more than good enough for this build. And what's nice about it is that... What's nice about it is that it's actually pretty much new in box. It's never been used. It's actually, yeah, the, it's not even been opened. It's uh, the plastic, the tape here is still... Uh, intact, and I got this uh, as a present when I uh, built someone's PC as a thank you, essentially. So that's it for the parts I had lying around. Let's now have a look at the parts I needed to purchase. Now, for our processor, I had actually quite a few ways I could have gone. Originally, I had my eye on a used CPU. In particular, I was looking for a 6 or 8 core Ryzen CPU from the first or second generation. So that is 1600, 2600, or 1700, 2700, or one of the various X variants. Now, that didn't work out, simply because I wasn't willing to pay as much for those processes as I suppose some other people were, and that plays into the whole thing I talked about earlier with people who are paying for CPUs on the used market. And the reason I wasn't willing to pay that much is because I was looking for a CPU for around 100 euros or so. And for that, I could have picked up a brand new Ryzen 3 3100 from a retailer, uh, and while that's just a multi-thread uh, multi quad core, it would still in most cases be faster for gaming than any of those uh, 6 or 8 core CPUs. So after a while of trying and failing, I finally found a CPU for this build. I did end up going for a Ryzen 3 3100. 
and while I did buy it from a retailer, it is not completely brand new, it had been previously bought and returned, and so it was discounted by about 10 euros or so. And so I went ahead and picked it up, because uh, that was a pretty damn good deal. Uh, even though it was pre-owned, it doesn't seem to have been opened at all, because the seal is still intact and there's no thermal paste residue on the CPU itself. So that's quite nice indeed. This is an excellent budget gaming CPU, and a great pairing with that GTX 1070. Unfortunately, it seems as if AMD is no longer manufacturing these CPUs, as they don't seem to be in stock anywhere anymore, and a lot of retailers have actually removed them completely from their sites. In any case, I am quite happy that I went with this CPU. The next thing I had to pick up was uh, the memory, and this one actually did go to the used market for. Uh, I found this kit of 16 gigs. It's a it's a 4x4 kit, which you don't really see out in the wild that much anymore. So it's a 4x4 gigabyte kit of DDR4 2400, uh, Corsair Vengeance LPX. Uh, it's red, so I guess that's nice. Fits with our motherboard. <laughs> uh, it's a bit slow, but we, we'll see if we can't get that up a bit faster. I think it, that should be doable. And the uh, third thing I had to pick up was a CPU cooler. Uh, so... I went with uh, the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black Edition. I would have liked to use an AMD stock cooler, which the processor actually comes with, but if you remember, the motherboard has no backplate, which the stock cooler requires. And the Hyper 212 Black Edition comes with its own black backplate, which is pretty much why I chose it. It's also just a fairly decent cooler, I guess. And finally, I picked up a case for it. I won't put it on the table here, but I'll put a picture of it, I suppose. Uh, I, decided, I decided to go with a Colink Void, I saw it on sale, for only about 50, do, uh, 50 euros at the time. And for the price it seems to be a pretty damn good value, it has some nice RGB effects, a tempered glass side panel, and an ARGB fan included in the rear. It supports full ATX motherboards and a graphics card up to 31cm in length. And now, the motherboard we are using does not have an addressable RGB header, but the case also has a front panel button for that, which is quite nice. I've also got a few 120mm fans lying around, so I'll pop this in the front for good measure to help with the airflow. So that's it for the parts we'll be using, so let's get building and then benchmarking. So there you have it for the build itself, and in terms of aesthetics, I think it turned out pretty damn nice. And I can't help but compliment the Colink Void case. It was a really good experience to uh, build with, at least for the price. There were a few things I didn't like too much about it. For example, the rear ARGB fan uh, that was included doesn't have a separate uh, header for the PWM uh, signal. Instead, it is powered by the same cable that handles the ARGB signal, which is a proprietary such. Um, so that wasn't great. Beyond that, the motherboard standoffs were not pre-configured for ATX, rather they were configured for uh, micro ATX, which took a bit of time and frustration to sort out. But both of these things are things I am very willing to forgive, uh, especially at this low price tag for this set of features, that is to say, ARGB and tempered glass. 
and so forth. I also am pretty impressed by how it performed uh, in terms of thermals, uh, especially once we put the two 120mm fans at the front there as intakes. The uh, Ryzen 3 3100, which admittedly is a pretty low heat chip uh, as is, it never went beyond 50 degrees Celsius, even when completely maxed out uh, in Cinebench. Uh, and the graphics card hovered in mid in the mid 60s to the low 70s degrees Celsius, so which is well within spec. So that is quite nice to see. But a computer can't just look good and cool well; it also needs to perform well in terms of actual frame rates. So how did it do? Well, let's have a look. Cyberpunk 2077 is a game that is certainly no stranger to controversy, but despite all the things wrong with it, I've been enjoying it very much ever since it launched. At this point, I believe I have around 200,000 or so. What can't be denied though is that it is a very demanding game indeed, and really pushes the hardware in any PC, especially graphics cards. When testing this PC I was running at 1080p with the medium preset and high textures, and the fidelity affects dynamic resolution scaling with contrast adaptive sharpening set to between 70% and 100% of that 1080p resolution, targeting 60fps. Now with those settings we managed a minimum of 22fps, a max of 72, and an average of 54. Now you'll see that despite the resolution scaler, a steady 60fps was not entirely possible. But honestly, for a game like Cyberpunk, I'd say that 30fps, while far from ideal, is perfectly playable. Now that drop to 22fps was momentary and only happened upon first entering the Charter Hill area of the West District, which I found to be pretty much the most demanding area of the game. Overall it was a pretty smooth experience in my opinion, despite the fact that the GTX 1070 unfortunately can't make use of DLSS to give it a bump in performance. As I said though, this game is very punishing on the hardware and especially Pascal GPUs seem to have it particularly rough. Nonetheless, this PC can play this game at perfectly acceptable settings and frame rates. In Red Dead Redemption 2, running at my personal optimized settings at 1080p, this PC performed very well indeed, with a minimum of 41fps, a max of 87, and an average of 66. Very, very playable results for a game like Red Dead 2, and it did it all while not compromising almost at all on the visual side of things. So this PC, and indeed PC of this sort of caliber, will provide a very good game experience in Red Dead 2. In Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord, running at 1080p resolution and a mix of high and very high settings, except for motion blur, which I turned off, testing a 500-man custom battle on this plains map yielded excellent results with this PC. That is to say, a minimum FPS of 52, a max of 112, and an average of 78. That drop to 52 FPS happened in just the millisecond when the map and units first loaded in, and once that was done, I never saw a drop below 60 FPS at all. Very, very good results indeed. And there's even enough headroom here that I'd perhaps consider upping the resolution to 1440p for a bit of extra clarity if you have a 1440p monitor. Do keep in mind, however, that this game is still in early access, so things are subject to change. But in any case, I'd then expect performance to get better and not worse. In Assassin's Creed Valhalla, running at 1080p resolution and a mix of high and medium settings, this PC achieved a minimum FPS of 35, a maximum of 95, and an average of 67. Very playable for a third-person RPG like this game. I will say that I'm not quite sure where that drop to 35 FPS came from, as I never experienced it while gaming. And overall, it was a very smooth experience at these settings. And someone with a PC of a similar caliber to this should not have any hesitation about playing Valhalla on it. I'd also like to say that it seems that Ubisoft has put a lot of work into optimizing this game since it launched, as in the early days, it's definitely not run well on this uh, level of hardware. And finally, we take a look back to 2015 with The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, where we tested at 1080p resolution, ultra settings with hairworks on and motion blur off. This yielded a minimum FPS of 56, an average of 72, and a max of 89. Once again, this is beyond very playable for a third-person RPG like this, and The Witcher 3 still looks very good when maxed out, even almost six years on. So, in conclusion, 1080p gaming is very much within reach for this PC. So, there you have it, my friends. We built a pretty damn good PC when it is incredibly hard to do so at a reasonable price right now. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Keep an eye out for future ones, and peace out.